Thank you. I'm Claire, and this is my colleague Heather Richards, and we're from New Zealand, and as you can see, we've come a very long way to be here, and it's great to be here. Um, we work in language teacher education at the Auckland University of Technology, and we come from a language teaching background, teaching ESOL and teaching French. And we want to talk to you today about a framework that we've developed. We've been interested in intercultural language teaching since we were contracted by the New Zealand Ministry of Education in 2008 when we evaluated a professional development program for teachers of foreign languages in schools. This was for teachers of Chinese, French, German, Japanese and Spanish. And our key findings for that study were that language teachers were developing their learners' linguistic knowledge, but they provided very limited opportunities for developing their learners' intercultural competence. So foreign language teachers at that time didn't have very much of an understanding about the theory of intercultural language teaching. Since then, in our ongoing research, we've found that although now uh, foreign language teachers in New Zealand are becoming familiar with the terminology of intercultural language teaching and they're engaging with the concept and the idea, they're searching for ways to implement their new understanding in the classroom. And this finding is supported by others such as Lidicote and Scarino, who in an Australian study said teachers found it really difficult to relate aspects of culture and communication with the students' personal lives. And we've also heard from other presentations here um, that TAs and teachers are similarly struggling to know how they should implement an intercultural approach. So there's a gap between the theory and the practice. Our current New Zealand nationwide study, which we spoke about yesterday, investigates both understanding and implementation of intercultural principles. In response to one question in our survey of foreign language teachers, several teachers said that one of the most useful things to help them fill the gap between theory and practice would be teaching notes to guide them in how to use their course materials to develop the intercultural learner. Now obviously writing teaching notes um, for a range of individual course books is a massive challenge. So in an attempt to bridge the gap, we've developed uh, a framework, a tool, that teachers could find useful to apply to their course materials to bring an intercultural approach to their foreign language classes. And the tool is underpinned by key aspects of literature. So we've synthesized ideas from Byram, Cramps, Lidicote and others, Elson and St John, and also the New Zealand School Curriculum, and Newton et al, who wrote um, a, a report for the New Zealand Ministry of Education and devised some principles. And we've devised a framework to help scaffold teachers into developing their learners' intercultural competence. Um, our framework is the, about the third iteration, and it has five domains for developing intercultural language learning. And these are the five domains, reflecting what we believe are the most important aspects of the theory. We'll give you a handout in a minute, so you don't need to write it all down. In this first domain on the left, it's important for learners to personalise their learning and gain an understanding of their environment, for example, their home, their school. Learners need to make comparisons between cultures. They need to see the connections between language and culture. And importantly, they need to reflect on their own culture and consider how others might view their culture. And students need, also need opportunities to interact with the target language community. We see these five domains as being porous and certainly not discrete entities. So this part of the framework is how we've interpreted the theory. And here's the full framework with exemplars of language 
that could be used by teachers and students to implement the theory. And we've got a handout here. I counted up, there's about 40 people here, <coughs> and we've actually got 20 handouts. So this, um, we'll get some more handouts and get them to we'll leave be online. the reception. But, um, and it will also be online, but perhaps you could just share them. Actually, it's probably not too small to read while you're waiting, but there's some also some further information on the back. So you can see within each domain, we've provided a series of questions that teachers and learners can ask. These are the WH questions that encourage the learners to think more deeply about um, values, beliefs, practices. And there's also a focus on moving away from forming stereotypes. And you can see when you look at the bottom, we've also put in a section on background knowledge and understanding. And this refers to each individual teacher's knowledge of both their own culture and the target culture. Because what the teacher brings to the class will also help inform the focus of the lesson. Now we'd like to show you how we've applied the framework in a language teacher education course. The course is the Certificate in Language Teaching to Adults and it's part of a bachelor's program. The course caters for pre-service teachers of both ESOL and, or EFL and foreign languages. And the CLTA course attracts students from a range of ethnic and linguistic backgrounds. At the start of the course, on the very, very first day, there's a basic foreign language lesson. And the aim of this is to encourage the student teachers to experience what it means to be an absolute beginner language learner and to see language learning from the learner perspective. So the follow-up to the lesson has a reflective component and looks at effective language teaching pedagogy. To maximise the effect of the foreign language lesson, we always try to find a language that none of the student teacher cohort has knowledge of. We're going to show you now how we've used this framework to begin to integrate language and culture in the foreign language lesson, which in this case is a lesson in Finnish. Um, we'd love to have time to do the lesson with you, but we don't, so we'll just talk you through it. As a warm-up to the Finnish lesson, we first ask the student teachers to work in pairs and answer these questions in English. You're with your friends or family in town, you want to have a drink, where do you go, what do you like to drink? The feedback to these questions usually elicits a range of drinks. So tea, coffee, chai latte, um, hot chocolate, flat white, pearl tea, coke, and so on. And also different cafes or restaurants or bars that they go to. This helps to personalise the learning, and the feedback helps them realise that even within their own group, there's a, quite a diversity of likes, dislikes, and behaviour around where people choose to go and what they choose to drink. We then move on to a visualisation. We set the scene in another country, and in this case, um, as I said before, Finland, although I think possibly this could be a lot of the United States at the moment. Um, the student teachers are encouraged to imagine they're in Helsinki for their very first English language teaching job. They're prompted to visualise the situation, the climate, the buildings, the people in the streets. 
and they're told that they've just arrived and they want to find somewhere to get a hot drink and they want to know how they would ask for it in Finnish. Then miraculously, a teacher of Finnish comes in and teaches them this basic teacher-constructed dialogue which is manageable at beginner level. So the dialogue we build up in Finnish has functional language of greeting, how to ask about price and ordering. There's vocabulary such as money, uroa, numbers, koksi and kolme, tea and coffee, te, kahvia. And once the dialogue is built up, the student teachers work in pairs and then they have a mingle activity where they're using the language to ask the price and order tea or coffee in Finnish. Up to this point, the lesson is done all totally in Finnish. And we then elicit a translation of the dialogue. And this is what it says in English. So A is the cafe worker, B is the, the, the new teacher in Finland. And they say, hi, hi, how much does tea cost? Three euros, two teas, okay, thanks. We then ask some questions in English to link culture and language. And the focus is on the language of the drinks order, two teas, coxi teta. And through questioning, we establish that just saying two teas in English without using the word please is generally seen as rude and unfriendly in New Zealand. Whereas in Finnish, it's quite acceptable to say coxi teta, or two teas, because it's an everyday exchange. And in fact, there is no separate word for please in Finnish. And in more formal situations, different grammatical structures are used to express the notion of making polite requests. So you can see that this discussion about politeness is part of the two domains, making comparisons and linking language and culture. This leads students on, student teachers on to reflecting on how they feel when people don't say please. And importantly, they also reflect on how their culture might be seen through the eyes of the other. They consider how someone from Finland might view having to say please all the time in New Zealand. You know, the Finnish person might think that New Zealanders are really, really fussy. Or maybe a Finn learning English just can't quite remember where to put the word please. Is it at the beginning or the middle or the end? To give opportunities for further understanding of the context and making meaning, we show a map of Finland and elicit the neighbouring countries and how historically Finland has been involved in some wars with their neighbours. We link this to two official languages in Finland, Finnish and Swedish, and the student teachers then consider official languages in other countries that they know about. So who uses the official language? How do they, or languages, how do they use them? Is it in official documentation, um, in local everyday interactions? Is it in the signage? And the fact that in New Zealand there are two official languages, which are Māori and New Zealand Sign Language, and teachers considered how those are used, and the role of English, which is actually a de facto official language in New Zealand, and not many of the student teachers actually realise that. So exploring these similarities and differences provides further opportunities for developing cultural understanding about both their own culture and other cultures. So this is how we initially introduce the framework to language teachers at the very, very start of the course. But of course, because it's the very first language lesson, there's one domain we don't explore, and this is the one of interacting in the target language across boundaries. Once the students have got some basic language of greetings and question forms and vocabulary and phrases, then it would be possible to set up some interaction with speakers of the target language. So that's one example of how we try, we're try. we trying to bring an intercultural approach at the start of our language teacher education course through the foreign language experience and the follow-up discussion on the lesson content and the pedagogy. Okay, so um, we've also done some work on seeding the framework throughout the course to sustain this intercultural dimension. And here's part of a session that um, 
helps student teachers to develop the pedagogy around dealing with a listening text. Now this listening is a teacher constructed basic listening text based on the New Zealand local environment. And we have to produce a lot of materials ourselves because there aren't a lot of New Zealand situated uh, published texts. So, did you have a good weekend? Yeah, it was great. We went out to Piha. Oh, I really like Piha. Yeah, it's lovely. We walked along the beach and had a swim, then we had a picnic, picnic lunch. Oh, it sounds great. Yeah, it was really hot. After lunch, we went for a walk in the bush. We heard lots of birds. Uh, then we climbed up the hill, saw the sea from the top. Fantastic views. Uh, then on the way back, we stopped at Titarangi for a coffee. And what about you? Did you have a good weekend? Yes. Oh, yeah, it was quite good. My boyfriend came over and we went to... He did. <laughs> <laughs> um, the traditional stages of the lesson then are the pre-listening. So, again, providing opportunities for the learners to personalise and hear about and, importantly, notice the diversity of behaviour expressed in the answers to these questions. So, how much time do you have? What's happening to the questions? <laughs> uh, what do you do in your free time? Do you have free time? So, <clears throat> and then the next stage um, of the traditional focus for the listening is the while listening phase. So we set the context for the language learners by introducing the two speakers, Peter and Susan, who study together and meet on Monday morning. Learners listen to the dialogue and for the first listening they put the pictures in order to show general understanding. Then two further listenings they move uh, through questions to develop a more detailed understanding of the text. And once they have an initial understanding of the dialogue, learners are then given the text to read and to start to focus on the sociolinguistic features of the dialogue and consider the context, the setting, the relationship of the speakers, that they are friends um, or they know each other, uh, the hierarchy and the text organisation and linguistic moves, so the beginning of discourse analysis. And then in the post-listening phase, the teacher provides opportunities to link and explore language and culture. So when did Peter ask this question? Where were they? Does Peter know Susan? Why did he ask this question? Was Susan's answer short or long? What verb tense did Susan use? Did Susan ask him about his weekend? So these questions reveal Peter's intent, which is to create a connection, show interest in someone he knows after a short break of the weekend. And key things about Susan's response are that People, note, uh, people often respond to this question with some little narrative or an explanation about the weekend. They often follow this with asking the same question back so that both people have an opportunity to make a connection and show interest. So this part of the lesson begins to make explicit links between language and culture. Then there are further questions to, did, did you have a good weekend? Um, in, to encourage students to explicitly reflect on their own behaviour, their own culture, and think about how making connections and showing interest is done in another culture. So there's a level of comparison and reflection, and together the students can start to make meaning about cultural practices. And from our experience, this generates a lot of discussion. 
So that's an introduction to the tool for the ICLL framework and how we are beginning to develop an intercultural approach on a course for pre-service language teachers. The framework is an attempt to bridge the gap between theory and classroom practice and we were rather nervous about this because lots of people have said they want this but actually doing this at the language level has been is a challenge. Um, the questions we feel and I've had some feedback on help scaffold the teacher in developing the learner's intercultural awareness, raising their awareness of this relationship between language and culture. We've talked about how we used it with a very uh, beginner's class on the first day they arrive on the course uh, with a finished lesson for those pre-service teachers and it's formed a good background for examining language teaching pedagogy, so asking pre-service teachers to deconstruct that lesson and consider how this lesson was managed. And um, as well, um, we've given you, uh, as the um, exemplar of the finished lesson, we've also just given a brief example of how we are trying to develop an intercultural approach to other parts of the course and weave this in. Before we finish, we'd just like uh, you to discuss with perhaps the person sitting next to you your thoughts about the framework and consider would this framework be useful for you or anyone you're working with? Could you see possibly aspects that you might find useful um, to use this framework? Um, possibly, if so, how? So we thought just two minutes to talk about it and then we'd really like your feedback or comment or to take any questions. Okay, so it's again, talk to your neighbour. Okay, everybody. Okay. Um, I hope you're talking about the framework and not lunch, which is probably what you're hanging out for. Um, okay, so um, would anybody like to comment or um, any, any feedback? Of discourse analysis, 
Um, a lot of the students with whom I work who might be training wouldn't necessarily be familiar with those frameworks already. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you integrate those into the professional development and teacher training. That they wouldn't be? Wouldn't they wouldn't be in my case. Yeah. Um, maybe it's the, the yeah. stuff. And, and that's a good point. I think we were using the terminology here, but we wouldn't actually necessarily talk about this course analysis because these are three service teachers. So we would probably say, um, can you see how this text is organized? The, the length of the input question to point out, well, who says the most? Um, why is this much, you know, at quite basic levels? Of, you know, why is Susan um, saying a lot? And at much more basic terminology than actually introducing features and some tactical features at this stage here. So keeping it at, at a, a much a more basic level. I wouldn't say something for 44 k Justin asked me to tell everyone the poster session is 1.30 to 2.30 in the desert room. It's in the small pool, but not in the big one. So 1.30 to 2.30 in the desert room. Um, I would just like to share uh, what we talked about here. Um, in the case of a group of students who may be returning to their home country after they've experienced um, learning a language or improving their language overseas in a, a, a program, that this framework could possibly be useful for making sense of what they've learned. So um, I think there's different ways that it can be used. So especially if they are going to be teaching, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very specialized group maybe, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think that you know intercultural communication is something that is a course could be used to prepare students to go overseas and mm -hmm. also to debrief and make sense of what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would say um, one thing that it, why I think it works so well um, with the cohort of students that we've got in schools in New Zealand and on this course is that we have a great range of students with different ethnicities and linguistic backgrounds in Auckland. So the students who come on the course have got a huge amount to offer. It isn't a monolingual cohesive group and probably that's happening more and more. But um, also for a teacher who might go away and use it in a school in New Zealand, is that actually within those classes also there's a huge diversity of students and what they actually do and the homes they're going to and um, so it does have some impact and not a monolingual group, which is great. I'm going to open the floor for questions for any of our speakers who spoke today. Um, we're running a little fast, so we have plenty of time. I just had a real Quick question. Sorry. I just had a quick question for Dr. Goldstein. I was just wondering if in your blogs with the students, if any of them became more aware of their intercultural competence in their like personal life, private life, and how they respond to other people, and um, maybe with a little bit more empathy. Um, I know that sometimes when I read on Facebook or posts or Twitter, 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 <laughs> Twitter, um, there seems to be lack of a filter, there seems to be a lack of empathy towards others, and I'm going to ram my opinion down your throat whether you like it or not. Do you see any shifts in some of your students' attitudes? Do those ideas come up in the blog? I don't know where they start from, in a right. sense, you know, no. so it's hard to comment on right. that, but the blogs ask them to go um, bi-directionally. So they're observing um, first for things that are relevant to their own culture and language backgrounds, and then to other language and cultural backgrounds. So they do both. And because my classes are very diverse in terms of my students' backgrounds, not only are they going both ways, but they're exposed to what everybody else is doing. There are 20, 25 students in the class. And I do think that the blogs make that, I mean, it develops their observational and reflection skills. 
and it makes them much more aware of what's going on both in their own cultures and in other cultures. So in that sense, I do think it develops sensitivity. But, um, you know, there's always a difference between what students do in a classroom and what they might do on Facebook or somewhere else, and depending upon what identity they're trying to um, enact in any particular situation. So I don't know more generally if it And does. you have, a, your population is an international group. It's not just Western My population students. are American-born and international students all studying, um, Mas getting master's degrees in a diverse er um, number of areas, but hold this all together is that practically all the faculty and students have lived in a country other than their own, have learned a, at least one language other than their own, and have chosen to be there at the institute because of its multilingual, multicultural um, setting. What I find really interesting is that despite that, one would think, um, that people, well actually, I don't think this way. A lot of people think that people develop into cultural competence, in a sense I call it the osmosis model, well if you just kind of plunk them down somewhere, they'll do it, and what we see is that, in fact, even with our population, which is a very select population, there's a great need to develop that into cultural competence. Thank you so much. Thank you.